our material is the Lutheran difference. And we're just going to uh, take a little bit of time each week to look at um, kind of some of the core values and teachings that make the Lutheran way of following Jesus distinctive. Um, like we said, not better, but distinctive, okay? <laughs> and um, I, I said our, our topic tonight is radical grace. Um, the top, another word might be justification, and we'll be talking more about that throughout the evening, okay? So that's our number one topic because this is the, the starting point. This is the foundation for everything we believe as Lutheran Christians. And it's not that other Christians don't believe this, it's just that we are more, uh, tend to be more insistent upon it than other people. So we're going to talk about it and how this came to be. And I, I think we want to go back really to the beginning of time. Really from the beginning of time, humans have had this profound sense that they are at odds with the gods or with God, right? There's been, there's been this disjuncture, this uh, broken relationship. Humans have always felt that. And as long as there have been humans, they've attempted to try to repair that relationship uh, some way. You go way back to ancient times, uh, how did people first start relating to the gods? How did people first start trying to repair that relationship? Sacrifice was huge. Sacrifice was very huge. Almost uh, it's a universal concept across the world, every hemisphere. The other thing that develops, I think, among humanity is this very strong sense that God is a big version of Santa Claus. In some way, shape, or form, there's this, you know, keeping a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty or nice. So uh, the, the, this notion becomes very prevalent among humanity that uh, there's this system to be worked. You know, religion is a system that you work in order to get the gods on your side or the gods in your favor. And that idea persisted even after Jesus comes and the church comes along, by the time you get to uh, the year 1500, what did you do if you were Christian in the 1500s to work the system? Indulgences. indulgences. An indulgence was a piece of paper, basically a certificate, that gave you time off of purgatory. How would you get the certificate? You, you, would buy, you would buy it. And what it was believed is when you engaged in these things, like fasting, prayer, um, you know, uh, pilgrimages, that kind of stuff, that you would gain merit. And the merit would go to credit your account. And you're building up merits in uh, the, hev the heavenly treasury somewhere. So forgiveness then isn't something that's offered freely because of God's grace or anything like that. It's something that's purchased. It's, it's working the system. Well, um, Luther, like I said, uh, is born in the system, believes in the system, and he goes into the monastery. Let me read you something he wrote when he was in the monastery. Luther said, this is a direct quote, I tried to live according to the rule with all diligence. I used to be contrite, to confess, to number off my sins, and often repeated my confession, and sedulously performed my allotted penance, and yet my conscience could never give me certainty. The more I tried to remedy an uncertain, weak, and afflicted conscience with the traditions of men, the more each day found it more uncertain, weaker, and more troubled. What changed for Luther was when he got assigned a teaching position at a university in Wittenberg, and he, used, and he had to start actually teaching the Bible. And in order to prepare for his Bible lectures, he had to study the Bible thoroughly, write a lot about it, now, basically, for like a thousand years or so, they had not been studying the Bible in its original language. They were reading the Bible in what language? Latin. And the Latin translation they were using, this was the standard Bible for many centuries, was, the, was called the Vulgate, written by a guy named St. Jerome. In the 1500s, people started getting very interested in this kind of return to the roots, return to the sources. And they started studying ancient Greek again, and they started studying biblical Hebrew. And when they started studying this stuff, they found out that the Vulgate um, had, um, had quite a few errors in it. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Uh, this is a passage that, that really bugged Luther, and it goes like this. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. Now, when Luther for, uh, first read that passage, it terrified him because he was thinking, oh my gosh, 
I, if there's any hope of me being saved or anybody being saved, we have to attain to this righteousness of God, is how he was reading it. Well, he started studying Greek grammar very carefully. And one of the things they found out uh, when they went back to study Greek was, that, was this. This phrase, the righteousness of God, this is in the genitive case in Greek. The genitive case often denotes possession. So it could mean the righteousness that belongs to God. That would be called the subjective genitive. But Luther realized there's another way to read the genitive case in Greek, and that's called the objective genitive. That would be the righteousness that God gives away as a gift, as an object. The history of Western civilization hinged on a point of grammar, and that is not an exaggeration. And then as Luther starts moving through the Bible to teach his Bible lessons as a university professor, um, he, he begins to see this magnificent news all over the place. 2 Corinthians 5.21, um, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Okay, who's the one that knew no sin? Jesus. But God made him to be sin. What did he mean that? Because when Jesus died on the cross, he died the death of a lowly sinner. In fact, that was the lowest way a person could die. And Paul is saying God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin, so that in him we might become the what? Righteousness of God, that same phrase, the righteousness of God, the justice of God. In fact, that word righteousness um, has a technical meaning, dikaiosine. It means in the, in the ancient uh, Roman court system, it's a technical term, which means what? Acquitted. Found not guilty. Set Scott free. In Romans chapter 5, it says that uh, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The emphasis being, you don't have to get your act together in order to come to God. You don't have to get your act together for God to love you. God loves you as much now as he's ever going to love you. There's nothing that you can do to make God love you any more than he loves you right this very minute. So you see, really, it's the end of the system. It's the complete and total end of religion as a system to be worked. You're not dealing with the IRS or the, or the bureaucracy of an insurance company or anything like that. It's not, it, 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 there, is, there is no Santa Claus. There is no list. He's not, I'm not making that up. There ain't no list. There is no ledger in heaven with your name on it. Nobody is keeping tracks of the merits or demerits. That's from the Bible. We know what he did with the list. Colossians chapter 2. Let's start at verse 13. And when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him when he, what, forgave us all our trespasses, right? Not some, not most, all, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands, he set this aside, doing what to it? Nailing it to the cross. This is the whole deal. That at three o'clock on a Friday afternoon, the Lamb of God died on a cross to take away the sins of the world, announcing once and for all that he was not going to count our sins against us because he erased the record, and he nailed it to the cross. This notion of justification by grace, the acquittal by grace, this becomes the lens through which we look at all of the Bible. And when you look at salvation by grace as the golden thread that ties it all together, and Luther's going to say, grace didn't come with Jesus, grace was there all the way through the Bible. Now, we're going to talk more about that next week, because next week we're going to talk about how do you read the Bible? Because why are all those commandments there if we're saved by grace? What do you make of all those commandments? We'll solve that question next week. Thanks, everybody.